Hi, good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, exchange session. This is the second exchange session in the framework of the Solutions Plus um, eCourse 1. Um, so we have a very similar um, structure today as we had in the previous session. Um, we will be hearing from very interesting uh, panelists from across the world. Uh, learning from the different experiences on uh, e-mobility and implementation. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I will be starting now with uh, just a few technical uh, guidance uh, elements on um, the different functionalities of the GoToWebinar. Um, so let's start with that now. Uh, I hope that all of the presenters can hear us and, and the attendees can hear us correctly if you have any troubles we'll show you now how to get in contact with us. So um, basically, um, you will have this control panel uh, on, on your GoToWebinar. Um, here you can manage your audio if you have trouble hearing us correctly. Um, notice that you can actually dial in via phone call and there's several different numbers from across the world that you can select from. So uh, use this uh, option if you have any, any audio troubles. Um, also, there's um, um, a few other items that I want, we want to raise attention uh, to. Uh, you're going to be muted by default uh, just to ensure that there's a, a good quality on the sound for the entire um, uh, webinar. But uh, you're able to raise your hands if you want to uh, you know, call on our attention, maybe there's going to be times during the webinar that you will be able to post questions to the panelists. So uh, in, in those cases, when you raise your hand, we'll, we'll be able to um, also unmute you and, and you can engage directly with us. Um, in, in, um, also, there's a, a chat box for que questions or comments from your side. Um, we'll be taking on those throughout the event and posting them to the audience. Um, um, and to the panelists uh, when, when the discussion comes. And we'll have just a few polls throughout the event um, that, that are uh, meant also to raise um, the engagement from, from the audience side. Um, but of course, feel free to comment at any time uh, on the chat box, um, not only about your questions, but also your views, your, your um, opinions on different items that we we're gonna be touching upon. Um, so the, the basic idea of this uh, event is really to engage in, in ex exchange of knowledge, uh, not only from the panelist side, but also we love to hear from, from your side in the audience. Um, and of course, this session is being recorded and it's gonna be a, a essential part also of the e-course. It's gonna be uploaded to the Mobility Academy as it was with the first exchange session, which we had a few months ago. Um, so this is going to be available as well in the Solutions Plus uh, YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to comment on, on it, uh, both in the YouTube channel, but also on the Mobility Academy. If you have questions uh, afterwards, we'd love to hear from your side. Um, so just to test some of these um, um, functionalities and also to, to hear from your side, uh, we want to make sure that you're, you're also um, engaged with the Solutions Plus Global Learning Program. So we're going to open up a first poll. Um, and this is just to know a yes or no, very simple, um, whether you have taken part of this uh, e-course. Um, and also throughout the session, if you have comments on, on, on the different uh, videos that have been uploaded, the lectures, um, or questions as well on, on the different lectures. If, if something maybe was not clear or you wanna discuss a specific point, this is also a good place to, to reach to us and maybe we can have a good discussion with the panelists at the end. Let's see. Uh, all right, there's some answers coming in. Mm -hmm. Let's give a few minutes more. A few seconds, sorry. Should it take that long? <laughs> All right. Uh, 
uh, maybe just to invite the uh, attendees that haven't replied to to just click on one of the options. Hopefully, you can see them. Otherwise, yeah, let us know in the question box. Um, okay. 50% uh, of replies now. It's 10 seconds more, perhaps. Okay, I think we are going to be closing the poll now. Um, all right, and actually, um, as you can see, um, only a third of, um, so actually a third of the attendees are not um, participating in the in the um, e-course. Uh, so so that's great to to have you here as well. I mean, uh, happy that more people are joining in, even though the course is at its final stage. Uh, but do may note that um, the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Um, are covered also in the e-course, so we would really uh, motivate you to to go um, to the Mobility Academy. We will post a link in the in the chat box in a, in, a, in a bit, um, so you can also take a look at those lectures if you're interested. And of course, um, hopefully you can join us um, on the upcoming courses. Okay, um, so just now quickly to continue with the agenda. Um, as I'm mentioning, the aim of this event is just to provide some additional illustration and examples on those topics that we've covered in the e-course, also learn from the different experiences from around the world, and interact directly with you, the audience, the participants of the e-course. Um, the agenda that we have for today uh, is, is as you're seeing now on the screen. Um, so we will start with, uh, after this introduction, with uh, just uh, an overview of the final unit of the e-course, which is currently ongoing. This is going to be by Giacomo Lozzi, our colleague from the Polis Network. And then we have a really great um, uh, list of panelists for today uh, representing the different regions in the world. Um, as you can see, we're going to be hearing from uh, Madrid, from Pasig in Philippines, from the African region, and also from Uruguay on um, the different challenges and experiences on uh, implementing e-mobility. Um, Afterwards, we'll have just a panel discussion with a few questions. Here, you can also post your questions, and then we'll have a QA, and a It is an open Q&A at the end of the session. So with this, I would just invite Giacomo um, to take on the first of the presentations. Um, I think uh, I'll give you the presenters, right, uh, Giacomo? Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, OK. Here we go. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, thanks, Daniel, and uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Giacomo Lozzi. I'm a urban freight coordinator at Polis, which is a network of cities and regions working on transport innovation. And together with my colleagues um, uh, Claudia Ribeiro and Sabina Zanova, we coordinate the uh, work package two of the um, of this project that is about capacity building. In within this um, general um, uh, gr group of activities, we uh, coordinate also this e-learning activities that for this specific e-course is um, um, uh, coordinated by Rubrecht. But so just to give you um, an overview of what we are doing in this specific uh, unit, that is the unit four, um, what does e-mobility uh, looks like, um, look like, sorry, look like um, on the ground. The idea of this uh, unit is um, to provide cities with practical guidance uh, and insights on how to introduce immobility on fields, because we have uh, seen also in previous uh, modules and units uh, um, a lot of um, information in general on uh, on immobility. But here we are really looking at uh, 
how this can uh, uh, finally take uh, place in, uh, in real terms. So we have divided uh, the work into um, four main areas. The first one being the uh, discussion around policy measures and uh, incentives. So uh, what are uh, the interventions uh, from the local and public authorities in general to make uh, to to boost the um, electrification of the vehicles in, um, in different areas, both for passenger, public transport, and uh, freight um, um, uh, movements. So, in this uh, part of the um, of the course, we look uh, especially at um, uh, urban vehicle access regulation. That's that's what uh, UVER stands for and uh, in particular low and uh, zero emission zones as uh, enable enablers for um, uh, climate uh, change and uh, the reduction of uh, air pollution. Because there are many different types of access regulation, but in uh, linked to um, solutions plus, these are the most important ones, of course. And um, so we look at the different schemes uh, that are existing, how they are implemented in, in different cities, and we um, bring a lot of um, good practices into the picture from uh, different cities around the world. We also um, look at um, really concrete steps of uh, um, promoting uh, the different access regulations that, as you might know, uh, are very different across cities. And so the, we want also to, to promote a common approach and uh, for operators and citizens that move across different cities. So there are uh, different tools like this uh, urban access regulations website in Europe uh, that provides a clear overview of all the schemes in place. Uh, or the Uberbox, that is a new project that wants to digitalize the, the information about uh, access regulation. And then we also look at uh, rewards and uh, fleet recognition schemes, mainly for uh, logistics. So how to involve the um, operators to shift towards uh, zero emission uh, vehicles in exchange of um, some um, rewards. And also we look at enforcement, that is a very important uh, issue. Uh, we look at more traditional ways of doing that through cameras, for example, but also of new concepts as um, uh, geofencing, that is a, a way of um, virtually um, uh, limit an area to provide then uh, a regulation that directly apply to the vehicles that end. Oh. Doesn't seem we can hear you, Giacomo. Uh, is the audio there? Hello? Yeah, now we can hear you. Perfect. Oh, sorry. I think I had a problem with my... But it was just at the end, so the, the rest was fine. No worries. Okay, sorry. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, so this is uh, the first module. Then we uh, look specifically at the charging infrastructure planning in public areas. So um, it's really the focus of um, this module in, is um, how uh, charging infrastructure can be integrated into into the, the urban fabric, so looking really at the public uh, side of it and not looking at private uh, charging um, uh, charging stations. And uh, on one side, we look at the mo modeling or uh, uh, and forecasting of recharging um, infrastructure. So look at the demand side. This is an approach that in the Netherlands has been quite popular lately, but we also look at the issues of uh, integrating the charging infrastructure into the uh, urban space, especially ones that will be much more 
uh, uh, vehicles and so the, the infrastructure will be much more prominent in cities and also the uh, integration with the energy we want the charging uh, coming from uh, clean energy and so that's also an issue especially in the integration of this policy then uh, the third module is about procurement of e-mobility and so we give guidance on uh, procurement procedures related to e-mobility implementation that it's both for infrastructure or vehicle uh, fleet uh, we also bring a lot of examples uh, here from different cities and also very interesting studies on, um, on how to uh, procure and we look at the uh, three main dimensions, public charging infrastructure, public transport, and corporate and freight fleet procurement. And last but not least, this is also um, uh, seems uh, not so important, but actually also preparing this module, we realized that it's very important that cities um, communicate and promote very well uh, the initiative they are uh, undertaking, and uh, they also provide a framework uh, to engage the stakeholders that uh, can be both citizens, but also uh, the companies that have to make this very uh, complicated uh, shift towards uh, electromobility. So they need to understand how to do it and uh, also what are the benefits for them. And so also here we provide a lot of examples of existing and uh, successful campaigns that um, uh, Solutions Plus cities and other cities have uh, implemented and there are a lot of interviews um, from them on how they did it. So that's all, uh, that was a very short overview. I invite you to attend um, the, the e-course and then uh, also th there will be the occasion to interact directly with people involved in the preparation. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Giacomo, for this overview. Um, that's great, and uh, we would uh, really invite all of the attendees to to go to the Mobility Academy. Those who are not participating in the course or learn from this uh, unit, which is uh, our final one for the eCourse One. Uh, so the videos are now um, this week also being uploaded. Some new content. Um, so let us know if you have any questions, and let's now um, see if there's any questions from the audience for Giacomo. Uh, I don't think I've seen anything yet, so it seems everything's quite clear, but if there's anything, um, just uh, in, the, in the chat box, um, and we can um, maybe go back to, to Giacomo uh, after one of our panelists. Thank you. Yeah. I can also reply directly in the box if I see anything. That's also true, yeah. Thank you. All right, now... Um, Let me see. Okay, let's continue with agenda. So the next item um, we have is on um, here we go. So the the uh, presentation from our panelists, as as we mentioned, um, are going to be uh, particularly on the different challenges of planning and implementing e-mobility uh, across the the different regions in the world. We'll hear from experiences and lessons learned, um, and we would invite now uh, Sergio Fernandez uh, to start with his presentation. Um, Sergio. Um, has a master's in forestry engineering by the Polytechnic University of Madrid, and uh, he's an expert in geographical information system and remote sensing from the Complutense University in Madrid. And he has worked uh, as environmental consultant in the biggest law firm in Spain until 2008, uh, when he joined EMT Madrid. Uh, this is the Madrid public transport company. Uh, and it, it, this, this uh, company, EMT Madrid, is the biggest public uh, mobility operator in Spain. Uh, has um, basically transports of over 440 million passengers per year, uh, with more than 2,000 buses, uh, and also manages all the mobility services such as e-bike sharing scheme. So we definitely want to hear from the experience in Madrid. 
um, and um, how the implementation of e-mobility has uh, taken place, what, are, what have been the, the main challenges, um, and in this case also in terms of charging infrastructure planning. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Sergio. Um, Thanks to you. I will you. give you now the presenting rights. Mm -hmm. uh, we can take over. There we go. Okay. Okay. There we go. So, um, can you see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Very in presentation um, mode, though. Uh -huh. Now it's in presentation mode, right? Now it is, yeah. Okay. Now I just need to make this box slightly uh, smaller. Typically, otherwise, uh, yeah, there, yeah, there's this that. Uh, orange arrow exactly at the top. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for counting on EMT Madrid for this session. Um, so, uh, my presentation will focus mostly on uh, charging infrastructure. So, as, uh, as you mentioned, we are a public transport operator. We are fully owned by the city. Um, and though I will be more than glad to, to participate in upcoming sessions to talk about public transport, electric mobility, and how we have carried out our electrification strategy. Uh, this time I will, focus in, I will be focusing on charging infrastructure. So it's more from the city uh, point of view, from the municipality point of view, and maybe um, mainly addressing uh, a private use of this charging infrastructure. So um, I must say that planning for immobility hasn't been an easy way. So many times we are used to have a, a lot of information and, and things seem to be quite easy, but indeed the first uh, public charging infrastructure in the city of Madrid dates back from 2009 via a project that was promoted by the national government to deploy charging infrastructure in three different Spanish cities. So this, this was the first, uh, let's say, step. And back in that time, we knew almost nothing about charging infrastructure. So it was it was quite a challenge from any single point of view, either administrative, um, technical, operational, uh, even in the market, there were very little amount of models, available models, and there was even no regulation and no standardization and no technicals, uh, technical guidance. So uh, in the meantime, we started uh, setting a dialogue and knowledge exchange by different forums and different local networks, uh, becoming involved in European networks as well, promoting and disseminating every little uh, initiative we had, so signing also agreements and partnerships with different OEMs, different stakeholders, uh, becoming involved in events, uh, developing a website, um, getting involved actively in different projects, uh, either European funded projects or projects funded by other European institutions mostly. And as you can see, that, that made it a long way uh, from 2009 up to 2016 mostly. And um, there you can see the pictures, for instance, on the right hand side, those initial charging points we deployed in the street. It was really, I must say, honestly to all of you, it was kind of a nightmare because uh, uh, just only the administrative procedure to get the permissions to build and set those charging points in the street was really, really very complicated. And then you have all the pictures of these initiatives. But what it is more important is that thanks to this, we finally develop policies. So thanks to all these previous experience, uh, the, the City Council of Madrid finally deployed and developed different policies such as regulations, strategies, plans, incentives, etc. So this is indeed a long process. So here you have an overview since 2006 as well, uh, that all the different steps in terms of local regulations that we need uh, to integrate to a certain extent all these electric mobility topics. So um, the first, I would say, proper um, document that included uh, information about electric mobility is the so-called Plan A, Air Quality and Climate Change Plan in 2017. And then finally, today, the main strategic documents in Madrid are uh, those uh, 
circled in red with the new uh, sustainability strategy of Madrid, it's so-called Madrid 360 strategy, the new ordinance on air quality and sustainability that was recently approved. And actually, this new ordinance includes, for instance, the minimum requirement uh, and number of charging points at every single parking facility, either private or public. And then for the rest of this year, uh, we will have the revision and update of the Madrid SAMP, the Sustainable German Mobility Plan, which will for sure include electric mobility aspects. And finally, also by the end of this year, we will have the new ordinance on sustainable mobility, which will also include all these. Uh, this new ordinance has been uh, pre-approved uh, by the City Board. Here, I would like also to point and to pay attention on this first initiative in 2006, Madrid Mobility Board, because it was um, uh, a dialogue organism so it was steered by the city council uh, and it helped a lot uh, developing this roadmap towards electrification and by the way uh, in the city of madrid the department that manages all electric mobility topics is the sustainability and environmental control general directorate so getting back to this mobility board of the city this is just an idea for all of you it's, it covers this participative governance approach. Uh, so this board uh, was functioning between 2006 and 2015. And the good point about it is that it, it, it put all together the different stakeholders of the city of Madrid that had something to see uh, or to say about mobility. So it was, this was, it was chaired by the Councillor on Environment and Mobility. But then we, we had neighborhood associations, the Chamber of Commerce, unions, uh, business confederation, political groups in the city council that is key to, to get agreements and to set long-term uh, strategies, the transport regional authority, local police, private transport operators, etc. and private stakeholders depending on the topic. And this is just an overview of all the different initiatives that during those years this mobility board carried out and as you can see one of the um, a specific strategies was about electric mobility that later on uh, was translated into a specific strategy such as Madrid 360 current sustainability strategy and the new mobility ordinance. So getting back to today, uh, an overview on what is the approach regarding charging infrastructure, the city is focused on fast charging. One of the main outcomes of all these previous initiatives is that uh, standard charging, which was the, the, the former low charging, slow charging, is not worth. It is too complicated. Uh, when you do it on the street, it carries a lot of challenges. Uh, so it is really not worth because on the other, uh, on the other hand, um, you would have public space allocated for a private activity, which is basically charging your car. So the city, uh, thanks to this initial project in 2009, we set 24 on the street charging points. Those 24 charging points that were initially slow charging ones have been upgraded into fast charging stations, but there will be no more on-street charging points in Madrid so far. So we are focusing on off-street fast charging stations. And these fast charging stations are located on free access private land, so no more on a public ground, that is petrol stations, parking facilities, municipal markets, commercial centers, etc. And the way that the city is approaching this is by public-private cooperation. That, needs that, that means that um, since uh, 2014, uh, the city launched a public-private partnership between the city council, which is the owner of the network, the supplier of the fast chargers and the, man the manager of the parking base, and two private companies specialized in charging solutions. So they are the ones in charge of the daily management and managing all the customer service, the app, etc., the repairing, and also taking care of the grid connection works, which is really, really a lot of work. So uh, we expect to renew this agreement by 2022, up to 2025, and there you have also some uh, indications on the price that, that we are currently in, uh, using the electricity to users, and, and also some, some, some aspects. And on the right-hand side, you have the pictures on how, how they look like. So uh, keeping on off street charging network, uh, the way that the city has done it is that the city council uh, procures the purchase of this fast charger. So it, it helps removing that barrier from private investors because they are quite costly. Uh, we have launched uh, three public sender uh, between 2017 and 2020 with more than 100 smart fast chargers procured up to 50 kilowatts and there is a new tender expected to be finished by the end of this year. So um, then this, once the city purchase the, the chargers, 
launches open calls for, for these private landowners interested in offering those services and therefore signs uh, different assignment agreements. So uh, for instance, uh, in 2019, the city signed five of those uh, and in 2021, eight of those. And these agreements, uh, let's say, lend uh, the charger to this private landowner for four years, extendable to four more years, and they take care of everything. And the idea is to have uh, these fast chargers deployed at every single district of the city. And also, we hope that this will, this will foster the private market. And last but not least, some specific solutions for freight and professional fleets, because this generates a lot of visibility. So this is also one of the key, let's say, uh, outcomes uh, that I will I will suggest for all of you is to to get uh, alliances and and to explore synergies with high visibility sectors, such as the taxi sector, the the logistics sector, because that generates a lot of visibility and helps removing barriers, and 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 makes people get on board of this electric mobility. So now we are we have submitted a proposal for the European well the National Plan of Recovery, Transformation and Resilience funded by the European Union to build electric mobility hubs. We will hope to build 12 of those, offering all types of charging and also potentially including hydrogen uh, supply. And they will be located in areas where there is a high concentration of uh, logistic activity, also by, by a scheme of a public concession for these, these uh, uh, facilities. So main conclusions. Cooperation among stakeholders, including public administrations, that's basic, uh, trying to uh, uh, that's something that doesn't depend on us, but pushing other administrations that have the capacity of setting legal frameworks. In Spain, in particular, we have uh, the European framework, for instance, that helps the state members to develop their own frameworks. Um, European policies and strategies, that's basic. And also increasing or raising awareness, including for politicians, and that's basic, basic because uh, uh, having the political will helps a lot communication, providing clear messages, but even most importantly, to explore these synergies, uh, to explore pu public-private cooperation and try to deploy projects that have high visibility and low risk, because that helps a lot. And here in Madrid, for instance, we, we have had a big alliance on the new shared micromobility services, which are all electric, either car sharing, moped sharing, and of course, e-scooter sharing, and that really brings people on board and they realize how convenient smooth and comfortable are those electric vehicles. So be passionate, uh, be brave and, and explore this public-private cooperation mostly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergio. That's a really interesting presentation. Um, maybe one question that, that um, from, from my side that uh, comes to mind, uh, maybe can you, can you um, let us know a bit more how has this uh, uh, cooperation with the stakeholders worked uh, because you mentioned that this is a big part of the strategy to engage with the private actors on, on this public-private uh, associations and then also the tendering of the charging points for instance in some of those private areas uh, did you already have structures to you know manage this uh, high level of cooperation in in the city planning uh, side or um, did you have uh, did you have to, you know, create the different instances and structures and, I don't know, teams to really um, guide uh, through this process? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as I told you, it's kind of a lengthy process and it's been a long-term race. So we, we started in 2006 by deploying this mobility board of the city back in a time where there was no this kind of local structure to manage this relationship with the stakeholders. So thanks to this uh, activity up to 2015, uh, I must say that we helped creating this momentum, this, this uh, favorable environment of cooperation between city administration and external stakeholders. Uh, now they are quite, quite actively involved in any measure. Uh, the city council uh, uh, keeps the relation with them through different meetings and, and forwarding information and different consultations. And, um, and of course, during this time, uh, 
there's been a change, an internal change. So the, the behavioral change started by, by ourselves, by the local administration. So, so keeping really involved um, and pushing these alliances with private sector in order to remove also the, the, the logical barriers we have as a public administration. We are slow, uh, we, we many times we don't have the budget, uh, but we have something very powerful, which is, which is um, the capacity of regulate at a local uh, scale. So, so within the city borders, and, and 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 it's been a way of pushing this by 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 defining local regulations, of course framed by another superior regulations, but trying to to regulate at a local level to push electric mobility. Perfect. So that I take it from that, uh, it's, it's been really a very long-term process building this um, cooperation and sort of uh, good, good ambience, a good environment for it to really succeed, right? Uh, and in this sense, uh, what we've also mentioned in the in the e-course, for example, is the importance of having that planning framework for to guide the long-term processes and, uh, for example, to to notice where the um, legal framework's not there yet and then where it has to be you know for the developed or so on uh, i imagine that was also helpful in the beginning to to uh, visualize where um, those gaps um, were identified and and what sort of action need, needed to be taken at different levels of governance then yeah because indeed uh, i mean maybe the situation is not the same right now uh, because uh, e-mobility has has developed a lot and and, and uh, but when we started there was almost i mean the, there was no information and 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 even many standards didn't exist uh, many many products in the market didn't ex exist there was a very little offer of electric vehicles so that's why i think exploring synergies with high visibility sectors may may help um, I'm thinking about the taxi sector or, or any sort of, a, of a public transport uh, service such as uh, uh, motorbikes in some countries uh, or the tuk-tuks in, in other places. Mm -hmm. And, and by, by, by electrifying the, those options, which is something that uh, Solutions Plus also intends to uh, and helps to, 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 to get to that point, uh, it's, it's very useful. It's very useful because you, you really uh, multiply the... The, the effect of 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 those okay. initiatives. Absolutely. Uh, I, I see now that we have a question from from Giacomo, uh, one of our, our presenters now. Um, so he want, he is asking um, that this is a very interesting initiative um, um, under the recovery of funds for logistics. And how have you decided uh, the location of the charging infrastructure? Um, is that a result of a consultation partnership with the freight stakeholders? Uh, I think so. I'm not directly involved in that process, but that's something that Enrique from Madrid City Council, Giacomo knows him very well, uh, has been more directly involved. And yes, I think they have, that there's been there is kind of a agreement frame, um, agree, kind of a memorandum of understanding signed with Merca Madrid, which is the biggest wholesale market in, in Spain. Uh, to promote this electrification, so it's it's something that has been uh, already um, checked with them uh, through different uh, meetings and, and yeah. But if you want further okay. details, I will ask Enrique and I will let you know. I will I will forward you the information. Perfect. All right. So thank you, thank you so much, Sergio. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, let's uh, then continue the discussion in the panel uh, discussion later on. Now I would like to invite, um, uh, let's see, where do we have? Yes, uh, we continue with uh, Robert Anthony Sees. Am I pronouncing your last name right? Um, uh, yes, you pronounce it um, C as in, uh, well, like you see. <laughs> That's perfect. All right, so I will invite you now to, to turn on your camera. Uh, I will already give you the um, presentation, right? So you can start setting it up. Uh, and to everyone, so uh, Robert Anthony is the current head of uh, Passive Transport and his work involves handling all matters related to transport planning, road safety and immobility in the uh, city of Pasig, which has about 900,000 people in the Philippines. Um, and as a partner of the Solutions Plus project, uh, the Pasig city focuses on uh, the demonstration of integrated and shared electric urban logistics solutions. 
as well as exploring the potential of, uh, for public charging solutions. So we're very much uh, looking forward to hearing from you, uh, Robert Anthony. Um, the floor is yours. Of course. We can see your screen Thank now. you, Daniel. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, I think it should be loading now uh, from Google Slides. Uh, can everybody see the top of my presentation now? There we go. I think maybe I should get this out of the way. Oh, no. Wait. Yeah, I think um, the, the uh, full screen is loading now, but we can see your screen. So it should be there in a sec. OK. There we go. Okay, excellent. So I think I just had to get the control panel out of the way. Um, come on, I think I'm just uh, having a little trouble because. Good. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think the um, I, I just can't see my own slides, but I think if I can just there we go. I think now I can see them. It's just that when I start talking, I start I start to see my own face. But anyway, um, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, Sergio, of course, it's good to see you again after seeing you the last couple of years in Berlin. Uh, it might be a while before we all get to see each other in person, uh, but I think that's uh, part of the challenge is really for taking forward a project like this uh, in time of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially as uh, countries have different rates of uh, reopening and commencing all of the normal activities. So I think for today, uh, what Daniel, um, uh, the topic that Daniel uh, uh, and uh, Giacomo and Sergio, uh, Sergio um, I was getting into, like the challenges of implementing things like e-mobility, uh, especially when given uh, different country contexts. It's definitely quite interesting, especially uh, since even though many different cities and countries have the common goal of e-mobility and encouraging sustainable transportation, of course, uh, every city has uh, its own challenges. Um, what I talk about now uh, of the challenges of the Philippines and Pasig City, of course, are unique, are unique to us. But uh, just as we learn how to solve different problems by looking at other cities and finding what works, I hope that uh, Maybe some of the things we discussed today uh, can be uh, useful to, you, to yourself and your own cities as you take forward uh, some of your own e-mobility initiatives. So what I'm going to talk to, uh, talk about today maybe is just a brief uh, description of uh, what we're working on in Pasig City, a little uh, bit of the description of the regulatory landscape uh, in the Philippines uh, and in uh, Metro Manila and Pasig City. For those of you uh, who are not familiar with the city of Pasig, uh, I may as well go to my next slide. It is the, uh, I would say, fourth or fifth largest city in the Philippines, depending uh, uh, on the year and depending on the level of economic activity. Uh, in 2015, we had about 755,000 people. Uh, by now, the estimated population, we haven't uh, done a, recens a recensus yet, but our population is estimated to be anywhere between uh, 950,000 and, uh, and 1 million people. So uh, we're located in the eastern part of uh, Metro Manila. Of course, uh, the Metro Manila urban region uh, has about 20 million people in it. Uh, so we are uh, really one of the largest component cities, and we uh, are kind of the gateway city of Metro Manila for uh, from the provinces coming from the east of the capital region. So in uh, in Pasig City, basically, uh, we run the office that deals with sustainable transportation, so walking, cycling, public transport, and e-mobility. In the Philippines, uh, I think uh, we have quite a unique regulatory landscape where most uh, public transport planning is done at the national level. And so is regulation of things like vehicle standards. So given that uh, there is so much uh, control held nationally of functions that would normally be done by uh, municipal and city governments in other countries, uh, in the Philippines, uh, we sort of have to work with what we can when it comes to trying to develop sustainable transport. And uh, in a city like Pasig, even in a city as large as us, most of our transport related tasks really boil down to developing things like uh, walking, cycling, uh, road safety, and especially uh, the emerging uh, electric vehicle sector. So uh, if you, for those of you who are not uh, as, fam as familiar with the Philippines, uh, the electric vehicle scene here, I think looks quite different from countries like Europe. And in a way, uh, it's, uh, it resembles many other cities in Asia where the dominant mode of electric vehicle is really the electric two and three wheeler. So this is the type of electric vehicle that uh, even without much government support and actually without uh, much in the way of government regulation, many people have started uh, using electric two and three wheelers uh, in, an, uh, in the Philippine market. So uh, while the leading uh, type of vehicle in the Philippines is really uh, the motorized uh, motorcycle or motor scooter, uh, electric two and three wheelers are quickly becoming a alternative, alternative to, this, to these sorts of vehicles. Uh, we estimate in Pasig City, maybe uh, less than 5% of households owns a electric vehicle right now. 
but I, we believe that number is set to uh, get even higher as uh, electric vehicles become more, uh, more known, people become more familiar with them, and of course, as the infrastructure develops. Uh, like uh, Sergio said, uh, one of the real ways where people uh, begin to adopt electric vehicles is when they become more visible, when they start uh, to become more familiar with the technology. And uh, I think, I believe for many people, when you mention electric vehicles to them, uh, they really think of it as some kind of magic until they actually see it happening. Then they realize uh, it's actually not uh, that complicated a device and it's something that they can own. And then uh, they start to change their own behavior about wanting to own an electric vehicle. So in addition to privately owned electric two and three wheelers, there are a number of public transport companies uh, in the Philippines that have started to purchase and operate electric uh, minibuses basically. So I think uh, in one of the slides, if you see the green vehicle in the slide I, I'm displaying currently, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a vehicle called, uh, called an Isakai uh, electric jitney. These are small uh, minibuses basically uh, that run uh, entirely, uh, entirely electric. So these are, uh, they have a total seating capacity of about, uh, I think maybe 15 to 20 people on them, which, uh, uh, and, uh, and they ply a uh, number of routes in uh, Metro Manila. Sorry, Robert, yes? uh, just uh, to check, I think that the sites are not changing because we're still on the uh, Pasig City uh, site that you were showing the population and so on. Uh, oh yes, um, well, uh, I haven't changed it. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just pointing to the little ah, okay. green vehicle in the picture. Yes. Well, uh, I'll just change to make the sure slide. that everything was okay. Super. Oh, okay. No, 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 continue. Sorry yeah. for the interruption. All right. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Well, uh, I'm getting to the next slide now. So uh, over here, um, uh, aside from the uh, vehicles that are uh, uh, being adopted by some of the private public transportation companies, uh, we have uh, embarked on a number of uh, e-mobility initiatives in uh I in Pasig City. So um, one of the uh, main things which we are, um, uh, which we've done in the city is that uh, the city has absorbed a uh, fleet uh, where uh, we operate and manage a fleet of uh, electric um, electric three wheelers. We call them uh, e-tricycles uh, in the Philippines. Uh, they are the um, vehicles you can see in the upper left here. So uh, right now the city has about, uh, I believe, 40 of these vehicles that we use for various uh, um, uh, for various uh, operations uh, and city-related tasks. So uh, we've uh, so these vehicles are uh, currently being used uh, for things like deliveries, for things like uh, shuttling around uh, inspectors for uh, various city operations. But I think um, one of the things we've been uh, using them for a lot recently is to uh, help assist uh, the transportation of people for uh, COVID-19 testing. Uh, if you don't. Uh, have your own transportation and cannot make it easily to a, to a testing center. Uh, these, these vehicles are ideal because they're fully ventilated. Uh, they make for uh, very convenient, convenient operations. And uh, I think they've been quite useful to us for business. And uh, this relates to um, the demonstration project we have for Solutions Plus, which we'll get in a bit, uh, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, aside from that, um, we uh, have uh, uh, experimented with um, contracting uh, more types of electric minibuses for various uh, city operations. Uh, on the upper right, the upper right image is a uh, electric vehicle called Comet. So this is a fully air conditioned uh, electric vehicle, which uh, um, which we did uh, contract for uh, auxiliary public transportation services during the time there was a shutdown of public transport during the um, initial lockdown for COVID-19. On uh, at the bottom left, you can see a uh, one of these green electric tricycles. So uh, this is uh, a vehicle being used by our post office right now. Um, we uh, had a cooperation project between um, the city government and the local branch of the Philippine Post Office where we used, uh, where we um, basically also secured for them a fleet of uh, e-tricycles which are now being used to deliver uh, mail throughout the city. So um, this is really, um, I, again, what uh, Sergio, the previous speaker, was talking about, where um, we're really trying to make electric vehicles visible for business use uh, in, very, um, in many different aspects of the city. And uh, on the lower right, we have um, uh, an image of somebody using an uh, e-scooter. So this is also uh, a quite popular mode of transportation, also a privately owned uh, type of electric vehicle, and one which uh, many people are uh, starting to use because even though um, current regulations don't really cover it, cover it at all, uh, it's uh, something where people are just uh, adopting these kinds of vehicles even ahead of the uh, the updating of the regulations by the uh, Philippine national government. So in Pasig City, um, the demonstration project we have 
uh, for Solutions Plus is uh, the development of an e-cargo quadricycle. So I think um, while many people are already adopting electric vehicles for personal travel, personal passenger travel, uh, the next step really for uh, e-mobility in uh, Pasig City, we believe, is the adoption of uh, these uh, small, uh, lighter electric vehicles for, uh, uh, for business use. And we see there's a lot of potential here for electric vehicles to displace uh, much more polluting and uh, much less safe older vehicles like uh, light trucks and also um, the sort of uh, cargo tricycles that they mount to uh, the traditional um, fossil, fuel, fossil fuel motorcycles. So we think that uh, by focusing on developing uh, a vehicle like this and a demonstration vehicle like this, uh, it could be uh, something that can stimulate uh, local manufacturing and a local um, design for uh, uh, to show the viability of this type of vehicle within Pasig City and uh, within the Philippines. So aside from maybe being an auxiliary vehicle to urban postal service, um, there's quite a lot of potential for urban logistics for uh, this type of vehicle to be operated in Pasig City. So of course, um, there are a number of main challenges we have uh, uh, in Pasig City, of course. Uh, as uh, we heard from the previous speaker, charging infrastructure is definitely uh, a challenge, especially since uh, fast charging is not exactly, uh, charging infrastructure is scarce to begin with, and uh, fast charging infrastructure is even rarer uh, in the Philippines. So um, one thing we're um, trying to do in parallel is to um, work with uh, local uh, providers and uh, local stakeholders to establish uh, charging points for business e-vehicles for um, whom fast charging is going to be even more important. Uh, there's also um, not that many options yet for uh, locally available spare parts and uh, spare parts, battery and maintenance, and maintenance providers. And I think really getting the after sales part of the supply chain for light electric vehicles is going to be uh, a challenge uh, that we will have to solve uh, if we want to adopt to uh, expand e-mobility in Pasig City. Uh, I think um, the economics of electric vehicles are also quite challenging. Uh, it's still um, a uh, difficult sell to many people to uh, get them to adopt electric vehicles for business use aside from the people willing to take a risk on it for um, their own personal use. Uh, because of course, then you're really asking them to stake their entire livelihoods on electric vehicles. And I think uh, this is where maybe uh, we're trying to work in Pasig City with the limited budgets that we have to develop uh, incentive schemes for people to adopt electric vehicles. And again, um, well, while we try to innovate at the city level, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the types of regulations that would deal with this uh, really must emanate at the uh, national level uh, so while we um, wait for those, we just try to innovate where we can uh, in Pasig City to encourage e-mobility uh, over traditional um, uh, internal combustion uh, and fossil fuel fossil fueled vehicles. So uh, that was a uh, uh, my brief presentation. I believe there's always more interesting discussion to be had in the question and answer, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, very, very interesting indeed um, to see how um, it has been very much on the on the side of the market and the users uh, pushing towards uh, electrification in the, in the case of Pasica. Um, and, and to this point, I also wanted to come to the to the challenges that you might have faced now on the planning side. Um, how has the engagement worked with these uh, private entities, the, the the service providers, for example, that you mentioned on, on logistics? Uh, and uh, for instance, on the side of uh, the incentives you mentioned um, that, that are being provided and proposed, uh, um, have there been uh, like a sort of a creation or participatory planning approach or how have you managed to, yeah. to, to work through those? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the big challenges for Pasig City, Pasig City in the Philippines, and I think many cities in the Philippines, is that Philippine local governments, local city governments, don't typically own as much land as uh, maybe some would assume if you come from working in a, in a different country setting. So when you're when it, when you're talking about establishing, like for say, uh, a network of charging stations, uh, the most important ingredient to that is of course um, getting a uh, uh, the sufficient right of way in real estate so that you can have uh, charging stations conveniently located throughout the city. So this is where it becomes very important to uh, communicate. Um, like, uh, for instance, in the Philippines, we have a um, a unit of government that's uh, smaller than the city. Um, it's called Barangay, but I, I believe maybe the um, maybe the equivalent would be like a small town or village um, councils. Uh, and these are smaller governments that have like uh, at least the real estate of their own. Um, little like village or town halls. 
um, that, uh, that basically represent uh, small um, distributed uh, patches of real estate that could be uh, initial locations for charging stations. So of course, when we um, engage with these smaller units of government, um, we try to um, find uh, solutions where we can uh, establish uh, charging stations on their uh, property and real estate. Uh, besides that, uh, I think uh, ideal locations also include uh, major commercial centers where we have to basically establish uh, a lot of small uh, public-private partnership agreements to uh, equip their parking areas, for instance, with uh, with electric vehicle charging. And of course, um, it's one of those things where uh, once you get them to agree to having the station on their property, it's a matter of discussing uh, who's going to co who's going to cover the cost for these things. Uh, how do you develop the business model to make uh, housing the electric vehicle station uh, better for them? And I think this is also um, really where part of the challenge is where um, while uh, we have our office that uh, gets a lot of this stuff, um, it's also a matter of convincing uh, local politicians in the Pasig City government, for instance, that uh, uh, that uh, pouring money into these sorts of incentives uh, returns far more than just uh, than just immediate cash. It's really about investing in uh, the future of your transportation system and even uh, arguably things like your environment and your public health system, because uh, of course a uh, more electric mobility means a more healthful city a healthier environment and so on and so forth. So, I mean, of course, uh, it's always trying to convince people to change their behaviors over what they've grown accustomed to. Absolutely. So thank you so much, uh, Robert Anthony, again. Uh, uh, let's uh, then continue with our next speaker and we come back to, to you in the panel discussion. Uh, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, so I would invite thank now uh, Ignacio Simon uh, to um, take the floor. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Hi. gonna give you the presenters right now. All right. Perfect. Uh -huh. And uh, it's really interesting now to hear from Ignacio, uh, who's joining us from uh, Uruguay. Um, and so uh, on the on the side of the of the national um, governance level. So Ignacio is an economist uh, with an MBA and a master's uh, in urban transport and, and economics, with 10 years of experience in urban infrastructure and mobility projects particularly with the Uruguayan government and uh, international cooperation. Um, he's an enthusiast of initiatives to advance sustainable mobility and inclusion, and currently is the sub-coordinator of the Uruguay uh, for National Sustainable Urban Mobility Policy, uh, NUMP project, um, which is financed by Euroclima Plus and uh, implemented by GSF. Um, so he's also a senior consultant for the project MOVES, um, which implements actions in sustainable mobility with GA financing and uh, UNDP implementation. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to hearing from uh, Ignacio, who's gonna tell us a bit about freight and public transport in, in Uruguay um, as a member of the Ministry of Industry and Energy and Mining in, in Uruguay. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and the floor is yours. I can see your screen now. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So uh, good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone. I'm going to uh, present you the initiatives that we're doing in Uruguay right now, particularly other than electrifying cars. So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a context of uh, the energy uh, system here in Uruguay, also uh, what we're doing with freight vehicles, with public transportation and other initiatives. So um, first of all, the, I think that the Something very unique about our country is that uh, we've completed the uh, first energy transition. So uh, last year it was uh, our ener electricity generation matrix was 98% uh, clean renewable. So uh, this is a big part because of all the um, uh, wind power generation that was uh, all the investments in wind power. So. Um, in Uruguay, electrifying transport is really genuinely um, decarbonizing it. So we are advancing on the most intensive use vehicles to get the most emissions um, reduced out of uh, out of their um, out of their usage. So um, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about this. Uh, we call it the ecosystem for freight vehicles. And to uh, go into like a little bit to the end of the story, it through this ecosystem that it's uh, a set of benefits, public policies, and private initiatives. 
we are able to make it profitable for companies to invest in electric freight vans compared to combustion uh, vans. And uh, right now, actually, we're seeing a big boom in sales of uh, electric freight vehicles here in the country. This uh, ecosystem has a is, uh, is made up of this uh, investment promotion law that gives back uh, tax breaks for investing in certain kinds of goods. One of those goods is electric vehicles. We also signed agreements with banks to provide green financing. These banks also want to um, um, be able to reduce emissions through their work. So uh, they are able to uh, provide financing uh, at lower rates than uh, you know, for regular loans. We've also reduced the purchase and circulation taxes for EVs. Uh, we also have a reduced uh, vehicle insurance. Uh, and also we have a, a, an electric vehicle free trial. So we tell companies that, all right, um, you can, um, investing in an EV is profitable for you. And companies may be like, mm, all right, it's profitable, but, but I don't know if it's going to uh, suit suit me in my operation okay we give them uh, an electric van for free for a month so they can try that this program has been uh, very very successful in uh, you know um, incentivizing sales and we are finishing work with the international with the inter-american development bank to uh, develop an, an EV uh, virtual trial through a smartphone app so you will be able to put a smartphone inside your uh, freight uh, vehicle, do your day, do your do, do, uh, do your job during the day, and at the end of the day, this app is going to tell you if how an how an EV would have uh, behaved during that real uh, real work day. So we are trying to lower the barriers to access this as much as possible. The other thing that uh, we are advancing on is on electrifying uh, the bus fleet. So our previous bus fleet was, of course, diesel-based. It was Euro 3, so uh, on an emissions, uh, from an emissions point of view, it was uh, you know, quite a bit behind. And from a uh, service perspective, it was behind as well. Uh, less than 7% of the buses were low floor. There was no board onboard trip information, no air conditioning, and also we have a, a gender problem that almost all of the workforce is, uh, you know, men, and um, this has a this is an undesirable result in itself, and also results in worse service quality for women. Um, also, another very interesting point is that. Almost 60% uh, of the price of diesel fuel is subsidized. So we are able to take that subsidy for the diesel bus in a, to an electric one. And that gives us that uh, this subsidy through the lifetime of the bus, of the diesel bus, is more than enough to pay for the difference between an electric bus, uh, an electric bus and a diesel one. And I think that's a very, very powerful message because uh, with the same money from the government, or less, we can get an electric bus that has no emissions, that really takes advantage of the uh, renewable electricity generation metrics that we have in the country. And particularly during the night, we have surpluses because uh, winds is still blowing during the night and there's no demand. So there's a, this very uh, symbiotic relationship between uh, electric mobility and renewable electricity generation in the country. And uh, to sum up, the, the government doesn't spend more money, the transport operation the operator doesn't spend more money, and we get an electric bus that has no emissions and that it has improved the service uh, quality feature. So we took the opportunity to uh, make a low floor and air conditioning and uh, onboard trip information mandatory for these new electric buses. So the electric buses is not only better because of the electric uh, powertrain, but also because the service is better. Uh, this is a picture that we took last year when the first 30 electric buses arrived during uh, this uh, for, for this uh, using this subsidy. And finally, to close some other initiatives, we have a new. We are working on a new financial on a new financial mechanism for electric two-wheelers, particularly to start uh, 
substituting motorbikes that are, uh, are very popular, particularly outside uh, Montevideo city. We are also working on last mile delivery electrification for smaller companies because this tax break uh, system that I mentioned earlier uh, works uh, mainly for bigger companies and smaller companies cannot get it. So we are working to get this to smaller companies. The country is also advancing on a green hydrogen initiative uh, to take advantage of all these uh, surpluses on green, clean electricity that I talked about. And also, finally, we're advancing on energy efficiency vehicle leveling that uh, we hope that it's also going to, uh, you know, incentivize sales of more efficient and electric vehicles. So that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. That's uh, really great to see um, the, the national level taking such a leading approach to, to make it easier for um, uh, this transition to e-mobility to take place. Uh, so what, what I heard from, from your side, it, it focuses very much on the fleet change, right? Uh, and how are, has the, the, um, like, like the um, uh, process worked or, or your uh, engagement, your cooperation with the local authorities, for example, um, uh, been in terms of, you know, adapting also the, the other requirements in terms of infrastructure or uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, you know, planning for, for those uh, user needs in each of the cities? Has there also been perhaps like a, a funding from the national level to take on this infrastructure development locally? Yes, thank you. Actually, uh, we work with the local governments uh, very closely because, you know, they, they are the ones deploying all these uh, national initiatives. And also uh, in Uruguay particularly, uh, some national governments have a very, very important uh, independence. So they can decide, you know, that they, they are um, completely responsible on deciding uh, transport and land uh, policies. So we really have to, uh, what, what we do from the national level is to provide, you know, I, I, think, it, I think a good name would be like a pop, public goods, you know, these national policies that uh, subnational governments can pick from and to advance on their cities on, you know, uh, zero emission mobility. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, that, that, I think that's, that's perfect and it's really important support to have from, from the local authority side. I imagine that uh, our colleagues now from, from the other uh, cities that are uh, together with us would also agree that uh, uh, it's so useful to have the national government supporting you in, in, in this transition. Um, so I think we, we should keep going now with uh, our last um, uh, panelist. Thank you, uh, Ignacio. I would now invite uh, Fanuel Calugendo, uh, our colleague from Tanzania, from the city of Der Al Salam. Uh, I believe you've joined us. To, um, yeah, I would invite you to turn uh, on your camera. I'm going to make you now presenter. Are you there, uh, Fanuel? Yes. Uh, well, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, unfortunately, I did not send my presentation. I was not uh, done with it, so I'll try to highlight a little bit on uh, urban mobility in the Islam city, and then talk a little bit what we are doing on the electric mobility. Uh, because we don't Perfect. have my bio information. I'll try to introduce uh, myself. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Uh, I, I've seen also that you're a uh, manager of system planning and design for the Der El Salam Rapid Transfer Agency, right? So if you exactly. can maybe just also tell us a bit more about yourself. Um, and great, thank you so much for joining us. I'm happy that you uh, managed to connect um, and looking forward to hear, hearing from you. All right, the floor is yeah. yours. Uh, Okay, thanks, Daniel. Uh, as you said, my, my name is Fanuel Kalugendo. I work for Da Rapid Transit, which is a BRT agency based in Dar es Salaam, uh, with the mandate of to establish and operate the bus rapid transit. Uh, we are uh, also responsible for uh, regulating the traffic flow in the Dar es Salaam city uh, to make sure that all the, the uh, 
uh, transit or traffic are properly aligned within the available uh, uh, facilities and sources. Uh, with my background, I'm a uh, civil engineer uh, specialized in transport and planning uh, with a master degree from TU Delphi, Netherlands. I've been working for government for the past uh, 17 years in different capacities, but I've been working for the, the rapid transit agents for the past three years. Uh, the, our our, our DART uh, agents uh, started in 2007, but we started the infrastructure in 2010, and our first operation started in two, uh, 2016 after construction of the first BRT. We are planning to have uh, a total of 154 kilometers of dedicated bus rapid transit, uh, which is of a two level system. Uh, with a feeder uh, operated in mixed traffic, then we have a trunk service on uh, a dedicated. Uh, services. Uh, so I will try to highlight a little bit on uh, what constitutes the mobility in the restaurant, urban uh, mobility. Our main transport, uh, prominent uh, mode of transport is walking public transport vehicle, uh, which takes more than 40% uh, uh, of the trips urban commuter are walking in almost equal proportion to the public transport system. Then uh, the public transport history back and that term is back uh, is dated back in uh, 1949, where we used to have the Dar es Salaam uh, Motor Transport Company called DMDT, uh, which was uh, Dar es Salaam Motor Transport Company. Then later in 1976, it was it was nationalized and we established the called the Usafri Dar es Salaam. That's transport in Dar es Salaam in English. But since in, in early 80s, the public transport once again was uh, privatized by uh, allowing the private sector to play a role in supporting the public transport services, whereby we, 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 we had to, to introduce the, the, the minibus, which is called, the, uh, we call them Daradala, uh, local names. Uh, that's been in operation since then, until in early uh, uh, 2005, when the situation were getting worse, then we have to think what, uh, how to transform the, the public transport by introducing the BRT. Then we start the planning until when, uh, in 2016, when we start the first operation. Uh, some of the challenges we faced uh, for, for, for on, on, on urban transit uh, mostly have been uh, the nature of our city is a centric city, so we have a lot of trips in the morning going to the CBD and the evening getting out the CBD. So all the time, the, during the peak hours, morning and evening peak hours, we are experiencing a lot of uh, 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 traffic jam, either people going back, going to the work in the morning or going back home from the work at the evening. So, and it's only, we have a number of radio roads which provide the main connectivity to the city center and out, out train areas. Then, uh, due to the monocentric structure of the city, we experienced a number of traffic jam. Uh, that's also affecting the, uh, contributing a lot of uh, uh, slow speed into the system, air pollution, and the number of accidents within our, our, our systems. And this has posed the number of challenges to economic operation of the public transport system in Dar es Salaam. Uh, from there, then we have to think of how do we have an integrated uh, public transit system. Uh, we have to think of uh, bringing the high accessible public transit system, which is necessary to consider a network of integrated services across the different city. Uh, then we have to thought of BRT, which have a uh, transit capacity, travel speed, reliability, so that we make sure those are improved, and uh, other issues, including safety, security, and emission, uh, be taken into consideration. So we, we, we initiated the BRT, uh, as I said, in 2005. Uh, and uh, uh, we, where we also, but during the BRT, we also think on uh, having an integrated system whereby we can uh, uh, link with the other uh, uh, transport modes to support the bus system. So far, uh, 
our, our BRIT system is having these are the, the main characteristics. We have it's a two-level network, we have the trunk and dedicated lane, and we have a feeder. It's free dedicated light of way. Uh, you can see the top picture uh, where they have their own light, but to avoid congestion. But we have a station uh, which is a fair and the, the fair collection, uh, off-board fair collection to reduce the boarding and highlighting delay and later depending on uh, the, the driver. Then we have a station platform level with the bus flow to reduce the boarding time. So this is the, the, the types of the, the, the this uh, picture taken from our system. This is a system which are currently we are operating, uh, one cord of uh, a total of 20.9 kilometers. But also in the system we are trying to look on different uh, uh, technologies, our buses. So far we are using the bus which is a Euro 3 technology. Uh, but we are, we are thinking on going to a different uh, fuel uh, technology, maybe thinking of uh, using CNG bus, uh, Euro, improved Euro version of four to six, but also we have consideration of how to do it up on the electric vehicles, or vehicle buses, uh, which is now a major topic you now think we are discussing here in, uh, in, in place. Uh, so far, we have not uh, rolled out any of the uh, electric uh, mobility initiatives from our side, but we are planning, we have a project we are working with under Solution Plus. We are trying to explore if we can do the uh, rust mile connectivity uh, with the e-mobility initiatives. We call it e-mobility uh, for rust mile connectivity. And uh, uh, the, the, the idea is to, 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 to have some feeder done by the three, introduce the three wheeler to do some feeding into our system. But the three wheeler will be using uh, electric feeder, uh, three wheelers. And we will establish the, 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 the points at some of the terminals where we can put the charging points. Then we bring in about 50, uh, uh, 60 three, uh, uh, three wheelers. Uh, from uh, uh, which some of them will be brought on one of our, our partner, 10 of them. Then the, the project will support us to buy uh, 50. This is going to be a pilot. And if it's well succeeded, then we will see how best we can upscale to cover the other, uh, to promote the uh, electric mobility into the city. But at the same time, we are also trying to, to undertake as uh, so, some of that to do some kind of a study, initial study, uh, how best we could do, uh, promote the immobility in, in, the, in, in the city, but also at the country at large, because currently we don't have any policy on the immobility, and uh, our uh, transport policy is, is, is silent on that area. So we thought maybe we need also to do some uh, uh, a campaign uh, towards that so that we can have political uh, uh, buy-in and have some policy guidance on the same. So those are the uh, clear initiatives we are trying to undertake now in line with the, the, the e-mobility perspective. Uh, we don't have a bigger story like my colleague was they are presenting their, 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 their initiatives, but we are still on the early stage of adapting the e-mobility. Uh, I would like to stop here and uh, maybe I'll contribute if there's any question from that side. Thank you, sir. Perfect. It, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Fanuel. Uh, that's that's great uh, to, to hear also from from the African context uh, uh, in in Tanzania. I would uh, now because we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but I would now invite all of our panelists to come on board, um, and uh, maybe we can have just a short discussion around the the topics that we covered today, just to close the session. Yes, uh, hi Ignacio Robert, uh, Sergio, thank you. Uh, I think you can stop uh, sharing your screen now, uh, Fanuel. I can, um, I think I'll take on the... I'm trying to do that, but I don't get it. <laughs> no worries, I will, I'll take it, it's fine. You can do that. There we go, you can see it now, yep. So we'll have just a um, brief uh, discussion on the different topics from today. Oh, but I'm sharing the wrong screen. Uh, there we go. 
Perfect. All right. So as we discussed, um, uh, and maybe one of the things that uh, we wanted to cover today uh, was around um, the different uh, forces that um, steer immobility uh, transition, right? And we talked about um, how it can be from the private sector, um, that they're interested in, 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 in either uh, you know, changing their fleets or also just particular users. Uh, and there's also then the side of the political side, um, which perhaps has also different expectations than uh, you might have uh, you know, when planning around. Uh, I would imagine, for instance, that um, in case of uh, planning a big infrastructure, a new line uh, of public transport or so on, there might be, of course, also decisions in terms of where it's located and so on. Um, how hard has it been in all of your experiences um, to, you know, align these different forces in terms of what the users require, what the private sector is willing to to engage on, and and sort of how what, what sort of measures do you, you are useful to manage um, the different expectations and to really, um, uh, you know, go through a the structured planning process to to uh, enable yes this sort of um, uh, measures to take on uh, maybe if if uh, you, you have any ideas you can just raise your hand but we can start with uh, uh, Sergio perhaps. Uh... Mm -hmm. Well, um, th maybe the Madrid use case is 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 a bit particular because we we started uh, quite a long time ago. Um, back in that time, the problem, the main problem is that the expectations were so so big uh, that the 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 offer in the market uh, was not really enough or uh, suited for that expectations. So uh, everybody was talking about electric mobility, and it seemed that it was something just around the corner. But the truth is that. Uh, the charging infrastructure or even the vehicles that were available back in that time were not really um, enough, uh, both in terms of viability but also in terms of uh, technical performance. So everybody was like just willing to jump on, on an electric vehicle, but then the reality showed us that uh, those vehicles didn't have enough range, uh, the performance was not really that good, uh, the charging infrastructure was extremely complicated to, to install and to deploy, uh, so that, let's say, brought us to kind of a death valley in between. Uh, and as soon as things started to be more developed, uh, it was more easy to, to, to promote electric mobility. So today uh, we have seen it um, by the examples of, other, of the other participants. Uh, things are um, getting better. And, uh, and the main alignment has been uh, kind of a group of, of factors. For one side, the, 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 the development of the market itself, offering more products, better products, uh, and also at more reasonable prices. Also, uh, the, the, the context itself, the European uh, context, but also the Spanish local context with uh, more favorable regulations, uh, and also financing schemes because incentives is also something very relevant. And, and today, for instance, in Spain and in Madrid in particular, if you want to buy an electric car or you want to do, you have a company and you want to buy a, an electric commercial vehicle, you have quite a quite a, a variety of incentives. Um, for instance, they don't pay the local tax. Uh, they they can they can ask for uh, subsidies to buy it, and then even the the, the car manufacturers offers um, advantages in terms of uh, uh, special prices if you belong to a special sector such as the taxi one. So all together, that all together, uh, it's been helping a lot. But uh, there, I think there is not a single formula, and the local context influences a lot. Uh, so, so I, I would say that exploring the cooperation with the private sector may help to align. Um, communication is fundamental with all the stakeholders, no matter if it's a, a, a user association or a public transport operator or a business company, a business. Um, I think it's it's basic to try to 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 converge the interests of all the parts uh, to 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 
be capable to to deploy in pilots and and, and to yeah start the way on the path absolutely thanks and and i know you mentioned your presentation as well for instance the importance of uh, awareness raising among the different actors as well as uh you know in encouraging this um uh, cooperation to take place has it been also the case uh, in in PASIC, uh, robert anthony for instance um in terms of how well the population and also the political level know what it entails to actually perform this change to e-mobility yeah um actually i just want to maybe like um relate to um what uh, sergio said earlier because i think um really when it comes to starting off with a new project like this where you're trying to introduce a new concept to, to people uh you do have to do a lot of these uh uh, I guess like convergence type of exercises where maybe uh, you have a lot of people that say, oh, I want to do it, but then they have some kind of excuse or they think that like, oh, it's up to somebody else. And then I think um, this is where the role of government is uh, actually quite important because uh, you are the person that everybody knows, but these people, these different people don't know each other and they're not willing to take the risk to cooperate with each other unless maybe government can like, uh, you, you, can, you have to be the one to host the party in a way. Like uh, you throw the party and then you invite everybody, then you make everybody for everybody friends. And of course, uh, I think maybe this is uh, of course good when you can uh, get a, when you can, uh, when the result of this is maybe like a large scale uh, implementation. But I think maybe especially uh, depending on the context, this is where I think it becomes uh, important for, uh, for people in uh, roles like mine to have uh, people who are not always technical, but more like a community organizer, for instance, where uh, you're the one who, uh, brings different people together and uh, makes the partnerships happen. So I think, um, you know, traditionally, especially in the uh, transportation departments, uh, there is a tendency to uh, hire a lot of people who are highly technical, uh, who are brilliant engineers, electricians, um, transport planners. But I believe that uh, in order to make these projects succeed, uh, one um, piece, of piece of advice I have for people who um, want to implement things like this is to really uh, develop that skill of becoming a community uh, organizer, someone who can build partnerships and someone who can lead different people who's, who do that kind of job to, uh, to be able to build teams of different organizers to develop uh, partnerships independently. So I think uh, that's really like uh, the important uh, next step and the kind of role that's very important for this kind of change. Definitely, thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert, that, that's truly really important to mention. And uh, also important is, for instance, uh, Ignacio, the, the framework that you discuss that is provided from the national level so to really uh, set the game on, on what is possible and what resources are available for local authorities to, um, uh, so to, 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 to um, engage and, and uh, uh, basically propose also activities and, and, and uh, measures to be taken from the private sector. Have you seen uh, in the cities in Uruguay that you're working with and uh, that are taking on this option from, from the subsidies and, and uh, um, fleet change, for instance, uh, the public operators that um, um, having this framework has facilitated uh, discussions uh, between the public and the private sectors? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll add to what uh, Robert was saying that, um, you know, the, the working together is very, very, very important to give uh, to give assurance, particularly to the private sector, that you know the, the transition to electric mobility uh, it uh, entails going into the unknown. You don't know if the vehicle is going to you know be suitable for your operation, if it's going to be cheaper, if it's going to be reliable. So uh, here in Uruguay, I think that a big enabler of that was uh, we have a group that groups together four ministries, the electric utility, the uh, petrol utility, and the uh, and also some local governments. And together, they, they were able to uh, provide a framework of, uh, of risk reduction to private operators so that, they, so that risk could be shared between the parties, I mean, correctly shared, and uh, you know, to push this forward. That's on the public transport side, and on the uh, on the freight side, I think that um, this same idea of, of risk reduction is very important. So these uh, free trials of van, of electric vans was very very successful to you know uh, 
take the fears away out of uh, if these uh, electric vans would work or not for you know certain operations and it turns out that they work for pretty much every operation so everyone's getting convinced that they should invest in these kind of vehicles that's that's definitely true yeah Sergio go ahead yeah I, I just wanted to to comment also uh, an initiative that um was launched here in Madrid some years ago uh, in order to facilitate uh, kind of a, a place where to gather all these uh, different stakeholders so the user side but also companies providing vehicles and companies providing charging infrastructure and make it on a, on a fun way uh, the city decided I mean in cooperation with the Spanish Association for the electrification of, of mobility to launch kind of a fair in one of the squares of the city. So the city provided the space, an open space. And then, you know, you had all these private providers and for three days, they could stay there and show the vehicles and people could test them. Uh, and it was really nice. So the first, let's say, um, uh, fair of the electric vehicle was something very modest. <laughs> but uh, it's been gaining importance. And now it's really one of the big events uh, during the summer time in Madrid, and the next one will be in September. So that's also an idea that can also help uh, removing some some concerns about uh, electric vehicles. And uh, and the other thing I would like to say is about the incentives. Uh, many times, uh, investing directly is very costly, uh, but uh, cities can set some sort of incentives, uh, such as, for instance, for for those uh, logistic companies that uh, can use electric vehicles, you can provide them maybe more more time to deliver through some specific part of the city or even delivering by night. Or uh, you can, if you have any local tax, you can reduce that, ta that uh, tax for those companies or businesses using electric vehicles. And even if it's a very minor uh, measure, it can help to uh, you know, make people think about oh maybe we should think about uh, just trying maybe just trying. So it's, it's another suggestion. Absolutely, and maybe Fanuel, if you also would like to comment uh, from from the experience in Dar el Salam, what have been maybe those success factors uh, uh, to to steer cooperation um, and implementation of uh, services there. Yeah, thanks, Daniel and the team. Uh, for sure, I think these are common factors if you want to undertake any such uh, project, you know, whether changing from one uh, technology to another. Uh, especially from our context, we need to do a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement. We have a number of players doing a different uh, activities, playing different roles. So you need the buy-in. If they don't buy in, it will be difficult for you to, to pursue that uh, undertaking. And uh, I can assure you, we, we, we started, for example, our BRT. Uh, it has taken a lot of time because of discussion. Uh, the private sector who have been doing the public transport uh, business, they are not ready to, 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 to adapt the transformation we are bringing. They think we are kicking them out of the business. So they need some uh, to be convinced that, no, this is another opportunity for you to participate into that. Similar, when we started the discussion of the immobility, at the beginning, I remember uh, we had the idea of maybe to try direct the buses, but we say, no, guys, it's, uh, first of all, it needs a lot of uh, investment capital to do the bus trial, and we cannot do only two buses in the, the, the entire corridor. Let we start with a small uh, initiative, then we can upscale and convince the the public that this is doable and uh, is something which is economical efficiency. So when we start the discussion, people they are saying, okay, uh, there is a number of operators who are doing the three-wheel operation. They do a lot of, uh, they support our, our public transport network business in the, in the city. But how do we bring them into to play? Because they say, ah, maybe this guy, they are coming with another project which will kick us out of the business and they will bring their, their technology which we are not ready to adapt. But when we, we discuss, we have some stakeholders engagement, so we did some communication. They started buying, oh, no, no, we, we cannot run away from it because uh, it's, it's something which is coming, either we like it or not, the change is coming. The only issue is now assurance, uh, how do the sustainability of that such a, 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 a technology. 
because okay. uh, from our, our country, we still have some deficit in terms of power supply. It's not even enough for the industry and the other, other use. Now, when you are bringing the transport sector, how comfortable is it to convince the private sector, the investor, to come and invest on the electric uh, vehicles or buses while you are not assuring them of the supply of the, the power? But also the, the nature of our, our, our infrastructure needed to be readjusted, redesigned, and aligned. But uh, so far, because it's a technology which we are promoting, we are trying now to do more. We are now on, on, on convincing them how to engage the, the community, the, the key players, the, the private sector, the operators, to understand the business concept. How do we develop the, we are asking them to develop the business models, how it works, uh, what the technology should be adapted and the like. But from the government side, for us, that we are playing a role more of the coordination part. We are not going to be the direct implementer, rather than we are going to be the coordinating different efforts, bring people together, give them platform to discuss, uh, avail some rooms for information and knowledge, so that people they can start picking up. Then convincing some of our policy makers, decision makers, to also uh, put this in their speech yep. when they talk. Let them uh, convince people on that one. So, and I on you, that's you, that's what we are thinking. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think this is a really good message to close on. Uh, are you mentioning, like also uh, uh, Robert mentioned, to be the host of the party, the community organizer. Uh, so there are so many more topics to discuss, and I would love to to really um, uh, have more time today, but already we're uh, a bit over the, the, the scheduled time. So I want to thank you all um, for being here. I hope we can uh, talk again in, in one of the upcoming courses in another exchange session the solutions plus is going to continue uh working on this topic so uh, hope that we can continue the discussion some other time uh so far thank you so much and thank you all of the attendees as well make sure to keep uh, an eye on the solutions plus website for the upcoming courses hopefully we can uh, meet each other again okay thanks everybody so it was nice thank to you. see you thank you very much goodbye Bye. Bye-bye.